um, four jurisdictions um, have actually committed to or indeed implemented increases in their minimum age of criminal responsibility, including the ACT, Tasmania, the Northern Territory and Victoria. In terms of the number of children we're talking about, so the current research being that which focuses on children aged 10 to 13 years who come into contact with police, we know that in 2021, 2022, there was just around 8,300 children of that age groups who were preceded against by police, uh, two thirds of which were male. Um, and 667 children aged 10 to 13 years came under youth justice supervision in that year. We also very much well know the overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children uh, amongst this group of children um, who, who comprised a third of 10 to 14 year olds proceeded against by police in that year, yet only constitute 7% of the Australian population of that same age group. Uh, I like this chart, uh, don't take it as gospel, it's rather old, I think it's from about 2017, but what it really underscores is that the minimum age of criminal responsibility is jurisdictionally defined and it varies incredibly around the world. And what it also highlights further is that Australia, until very recently, has had a very low minimum age of criminal responsibility compared to much of the world, including countries in Europe and so forth. Um, the United Nations, of course, recommends a minimum age of 14 years for criminal responsibility and 16 years for custodial sanctions, which is far higher than that which is currently present across all Australian jurisdictions. So, of course, there are multiple arguments in favour of raising the minimum age, um, which we'd all be quite familiar with. Certainly neuroscientific evidence about brain development and the maturity gap between children's faster cognitive development and their delayed psychosocial development tells us that there is a need in the first place for a separate youth justice system and processes. We also understand that there is quite a negative impact of justice system exposure in what is really a very critical developmental period for children and young people. In, in the Australian context, we also know that there's a whole bunch of disadvantage uh, uh, associated with the children that tend to get caught up in the justice system at these younger ages. They're more likely to be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, they're more likely to have a disability, and they're more likely to have child protection involvement. So these, this kind of background formed the study context where we undertook the current piece of research. Certainly there have been severe human rights criticisms raised and are ongoing. Um, uh, um, concerning the minimum age of criminal responsibility across most Australian jurisdictions. And there has been an ongoing campaign to raise the age, um, which has been primarily led by Indigenous advocates, health advocates, legal and human rights advocates, scholars and others. Various options are, of course, being considered by different jurisdictions, whether to raise the age to 12 or 14 years, should there be carve outs for serious offences, what should be the role of Dolly Incapax, which Nina will speak to more late, later. But policymakers actually to date have really little local data on which to rely to make these kinds of uh, decisions about what alternative responses could entail. So that's where the current study comes in. It was funded by the Australian Institute of Criminology. Co-investigators are with me today, Dr Nina Papalia and Professor Rosemary Sheehan and Research Assistant Rubini Ball. We um, thank very much for the research facilitation, the Children's Court at Victoria and particularly partner investigator Magistrate Jennifer Bowles um, and also the Children's Court Clinic and Victoria Police who also facilitated the research through provision of data. The key aims of the study were to really generate that new knowledge about 10 to 13 year old children that have alleged offending. We wanted to understand more about their characteristics, about their support needs, about how Dolly Incapax provisions are applied with this group of children and the nature of their offending court outcomes and criminal justice trajectories. To that end, the way we went about it was to bring together four sources of data. We had a look at national criminal justice statistics. We performed data linkage between police and children's court data in Victoria for a statewide sample of children aged 10 to 13 years who had alleged offending in 2017. We looked at a sample of 80 Dolly Incapax assessment reports that Nina will speak to in a moment. And we also conducted qualitative consultations, so interviews and focus groups with Victorian professionals from a range of professions, including magistrates, police prosecutors, uh, forensic psychologists, legal defence professionals and youth justice professionals, amongst others, as well as Indigenous uh, service providers. What I'm going to speak to in terms of presenting some of the key findings now is the two, these two components. So firstly, the linkage of police and children's court data. Now, bear with me, it gets a little bit messy here, but I'm going to um, talk you through the slides. So 
The study sample of the linked data involved all children aged 10 to 13 years who had alleged offending in Victoria in 2017. So just over 1,300 children in that year. We divided this whole sample, which is in this final column of 1,369 children, into those who solely had police contact in that year, which was just over 1,000 children. And in the second column, those whose matters proceeded to court, 272 children. So that's the difference between these two columns, and that's the total children. What this slide shows was their age at the end of, at their first matter, their police matter in that year. So what you can see from the data, as you would expect, is that those who solely had police contact were more likely to be 10 or 11 years, and those whose matters proceeded to court were more likely to be slightly older, um, 12 and 13 years. In terms of the gender balance, there was no difference between children whose matters proceeded to court and those who didn't. But what we can clearly see from the data is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were more likely to have their matters proceed to children's court. 21% of those children um, had matters which um, proceeded, they formed 21% of those whose matters proceeded to children's court compared to only 11.8% of those whose matters were only held at the police stage. We then had a look at what the alleged offence types were for these children and what was shown was consistent with what's shown um, in, in previous research looking at this group of children and young people. Most of the offending relates to property offences, while th about a third related to alleged offending against the person. And again, compared with children whose matters um, did not proceed to court, those whose matters did proceed to court were more likely to have a most serious charge involving an offence against the person. So 37% of the children's court sample had a uh, most serious charge of offence against the person compared to 27% of matters for those children whose matters didn't proceed to court. We also wanted to have a look at how offence types or alleged offending compared um, by age group. So when we looked at um, 10 and 11 year olds, you could see that the most common, most serious charge was actually that dark blue there, criminal or willful damage. Um, when you started looking at the older age groups, the most serious charge was theft. Um, what you can also see is as the children's age gets older, there's more likely to be a, a most serious charge related to more violent offending, so an unlawful assault charge, but that still only comprises a small percentage of the most serious offences or charges, so even 12% of those who are, of children who are 11, 12 or 13 years. We also were able to receive data looking at whether these children had been involved in prior intervention orders. And what we found, this was probably one of the findings that shocked us was the most, which is that half of the children had a prior intervention order at the time of their first um, police matter in 2017. And these mostly related to family violence within their relationships. We could anticipate that much more children had been exposed to family violence, but the fact that half of them had been named on an intervention order already, the vast majority of whom, 97% of whom were the complainant or the person in need of protection in their first IVO um, was quite shocking to us. The chart at the bottom here shows um, the proportion of children who were the complainant, the respondent, or both complainant and respondent um, by each age group. So what you can see is that um, at the age of 10 years, 46% um, of those children had been the complainant, um, um, compared to 28% children had been only the complainant at the age of 13 years. What you can see in the grey here is you start getting a higher percentage of children as you increase the age who have ha then had experience of being both the complainant and the respondent. And what we took this to mean um, was to be reflective of the cycles of violence, that we understand people who have been exposed to violence are more likely to go on and perpetrate that violence. And it also highlights the importance of this as an age group for actually disrupting those cycles. In terms of their court outcomes, again, quite a messy slide. I've divided the children up by their age groups, so 10, 11, 12 and 13. Now, this top section here shows court outcomes that did not involve any youth justice supervision, while the bottom here shows court outcomes that did involve youth justice supervision. What I want to highlight for you is for children whose matters proceeded to court, who were aged 10 and 11, no child had an outcome involving youth justice supervision. In fact, the vast majority of children had their matters struck out or they were found dolly incapax, i.e. incapable of being held criminally responsible. This starts to change a little bit when we see it go up to children who are aged 12 and 13 at the time of alleged offending, where you start to see a higher percentage of children, although still quite a small one, um, who are um, uh, given outcomes re related to youth justice supervision. So 13 and a half percent of 13 year olds. 
Overall, when we looked at the entire um, population of, of children with alleged offending across that year, uh, that were aged 10 to 13, 55% had an outcome of police caution. A further 25% had police contact that did not proceed to court for whatever reason. So, for example, police might have dropped the charges. 18% um, had some version of court involvement that did not result in youth justice supervision, while only 2% had court involvement that resulted in a sentence involving youth justice supervision. The final thing I wanted to share with you was um, some data about what we called longitudinal contact. So after their first police contact in 2017, we followed these children up for another two years and had a look at what further police contact they had. We want to stress that this is not recidivism. Um, this is not re-offending because quite often all these matters were dealt with at the one time for the one child. But we wanted to have a look at what was the nature of their ongoing police contact. Interestingly, one half of the children had no alleged offending in the subsequent 24 months after their first police incident. A quarter of the police sample and 37% of the children's court sample had no charges involving any offences against the person or any violent offending in the subsequent 24 months. However, there was a smaller proportion of both the court and the police samples who did have more ongoing contact with police over the subsequent 24 months. So a quarter of the police sample, a uh, court sample rather, and 6% of the police sample. So I'm just going to leave it there and then hand over to Nina to share um, the findings concerning Dolly Incapax. Uh, and I'll come back and speak to some of the uh, recommendations that the professionals gave later. Thanks, Susie. Can you see my screen there okay? Yep. Awesome. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks, uh, Ben, for the introduction. Thanks for hosting us. Uh, so my presentation uh, will kind of zoom in on a particular uh, component of this uh, piece of work, focusing on the kind of clinical forensic evaluation of young children who are before the court for offending matters and where there is a kind of legal question about whether they ought to be uh, held criminally responsible for those, uh, for those matters. So a key kind of premise of criminal law is that criminal liability should be imposed only on individuals who have the capacity to kind of freely choose to do something they know to be wrong. Uh, so children, because of their stage of development, they lack this uh, ability, but they gradually develop it as they mature. And so for this reason, uh, the law in Australian uh, and indeed some international jurisdictions uh, includes kind of two key mechanisms by which children are protected from uh, kind of criminal liability. And the first is the kind of absolute uh, minimum age of criminal responsibility, which Susie's just talked about. The second is this kind of doctrine of doli incapax, which translates from Latin into kind of incapable of, um, of evil or deceit. Uh, and really rests on this view that a child under the age of 14 kind of isn't sufficiently um, kind of morally or intellectually developed to appreciate the difference between right and wrong, and therefore they kind of lack the capacity to form uh, criminal intent. So the presumption of doly incapax is available across all Australian jurisdictions, either through statute or common law, which means that its application uh, isn't necessarily uh, consistent across the country. Uh, it's not a defence, uh, but it's a rebuttable presumption. So uh, that means that the starting point is that kind of all children above the minimum age of criminal responsibility, but below kind of 14 years are presumed to be incapable of appreciating the difference between right and wrong, unless there is evidence to kind of refute that presumption. Now, it's the prosecution who bears the kind of responsibility for both uh, raising and rebutting the presumption, and the court needs to be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the child knew uh, at the time of engaging in the act that the act was kind of seriously or gravely wrong, rather than merely kind of um, naughty or, or mischievous. So if the evidence leaves kind of open a reasonable possibility that the child didn't in fact know this, then they can't, uh, according to the provision, be held uh, responsible for that behaviour. 
Now, knowledge of the wrongfulness can't be inferred by the mere fact of the child having engaged in the act, no matter how kind of um, obviously wrong to your eye or extremely serious the act may be. So a lot of challenges and criticisms around Dolly have been raised over the years and certainly more recently with a number of kind of high profile cases. The definition of serious wrongfulness, for instance, hasn't been kind of clearly or consistently articulated in law in terms of what the legal test for this is. Uh, a, a key kind of high court of appeal case in, in New South Wales, it involved an 11 year old boy accused of sexually abusing his younger brother highlighted that the criteria of uh, seriously wrong um, was in the kind of moral sense. And so it wasn't enough to kind of prove that the child understood that disapproval or even punishment would kind of flow from the behaviour. Uh, we also know that children's kind of intellectual and moral development is not uniform and that there's kind of enormous variability in their early life experiences that can uh, shape their development and conceptualizations of what's considered uh, normative. So, for example, not all children would view kind of legal consequences like attending court, like police involvement as particularly serious, uh, but potentially normal um, based on their kind of experiences growing up, say, in the context of uh, violence and kind of family criminality. Another criticism is that Australian case law really concentrates on kind of cognitive knowledge of right and wrong and not necessarily on whether other factors might have kind of impeded the child's ability to uh, either access or kind of act in accordance with that knowledge at the time of the act. And of course, there are a whole host of um, kind of concerns being raised around the provision not kind of adequately protecting children from the neg negative impacts of criminal justice uh, involvement. So, for instance, uh, some kind of jurisdictions have, have made observations that the onus has tended to shift away from the uh, prosecution to the defence to kind of demonstrate a child's lack of capacity, as well as concerns that children um, you know, may uh, kind of ultimately be criminalised by virtue of their ongoing contact with the system whilst kind of awaiting outcomes of these provisions. Now, because there's no direct measure of dolly in CAPACs, the courts have to rely on different kinds of indirect evidence when deciding if the presumption's been rebutted. So this slide, I guess, outlines some key kind of evidence types suggested to be useful, uh, which I won't uh, review individually, but will say that each is again, kind of not without contention and I suppose uncertainty around how each should be kind of applied to the legal question at hand. Uh, but in some cases, a court may also uh, call an expert uh, witness to give evidence on a child's developmental state, usually in the form of a report by a psychologist or psychiatrist. And until now, there have um, really been no empirical studies about how clinicians kind of undertake their forensic assessments in these cases, uh, nor did we have any kind of research evidence of, about the kind of profiles of children who receive these assessments. And of course, that leaves kind of forensic practitioners with um, a, a lack of kind of empirical data from which to draw to inform their practice in advising the courts as e expert witnesses. So to address this, we analysed a sample of Dolly Incapax uh, assessment reports prepared for the Children's Court of Victoria, and we had these three research questions. So number one, what are the characteristics of children assessed? Uh, what are the uh, what's the nature of the alleged offending um, that these children are being assessed for? And what are the characteristics uh, or features of clinical assessments and opinions as documented in the reports? So briefly, we kind of reviewed a sample of 80 Dolly Incapax assessment reports prepared by psychologists at the Victorian Children's Court Clinic between 2018 and 2019. So this clinic is a kind of statewide service that provides specialist assessments of children and families at the request of the Children's Court of Victoria. So where Dolly Incapax is uh, kind of raised in a criminal matter before the court, a magistrate may refer the child to the clinic. Um, to seek a, a Dolly and Capax assessment. Now, at the time of sampling, these assessments were kind of undertaken by psychologists who had kind of knowledge and experience in undertaking these assessments. Um, the then kind of clinic director also provided kind of broad practice guidance for undertaking these assessments and would 
individually review each kind of report before it was submitted to the court. So onto some key results and just starting with children's kind of characteristics. So in terms of age, we can see that uh, kind of most children were aged 12 to 13 at the time of the relevant act, which is that bottom graph there, or kind of 13 plus at the time of the assessment. So really that uh, kind of on the cusp group in terms of the provision. Uh, Aboriginal uh, children and Torres Strait Islander children were overrepresented at a rate that is kind of broadly consistent with Aboriginal children's overrepresentation in the Victorian youth justice system. Uh, three quarters of reports related to children with current or past child protection system involvement and close to half were in out of home care. Just over half of children were engaged in education at the time and around one in 15 children uh, were expelled from uh, school, sometimes in relation to the charges under assessment. Most children had a confirmed mental health diagnosis and just over one in 10 had a confirmed intellectual disability or acquired brain injury. Okay, so around uh, kind of one quarter to one third of reports indicated that children had some kind of prior justice system involvement, but you can see in the last column of that top table there that many reports didn't contain kind of explicit information about this. In terms of children's clinical diagnoses, uh, the most common was attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, followed by kind of mood and anxiety disorders. And you can see that kind of comorbidity was common. So nearly a third of children had kind of diagnoses uh, across those broad kind of clinical categories. And despite that kind of relatively high um, level of, uh, of diagnosis, uh, the report suggested that only about 11% uh, of children were involved with a clinical service. Uh, about a third of children were receiving kind of um, community support services like child and family welfare services. So onto the nature of kind of children's alleged offending. So this is a bit of a, a busy slide, but a couple of key stats to draw your attention to here. So first, uh, similar to the work Susie pre presented, this um, you can see that the most common type of offence under assessment was property and deception offences, followed by offences against the person. Second, um, and moving to the bottom right of the slide, you can see the time delay between the relevant charge to the date of the assessment, which was on average about eight months. And in nearly kind of half of the reports, the assessment was between kind of nine and 12 months following the relevant act. And I think that highlights uh, a key challenge for clinicians in having to retrospectively assess a child's level of understanding and functioning at the time of the act, given what we know about the dynamic nature of children's development. In terms of the location of relevant acts, uh, not perhaps not surprisingly, we can see that the most common locations there were public spaces and forums, you know, streets, public transport online, uh, and also commercial areas. They're nearly one in five um, reports suggested that the behaviour occurred in residential care units. Okay, so testing domains uh, most often or, or commonly assessed by psychologists were children's cognitive development uh, with intellectual fun functioning testing included in 64% um, of reports and also children's socio-moral development with 71% of reports including uh, a test of socio-moral reasoning. Criminogenic risk and need measures were administered in about 9% of reports and that likely that kind of low number likely reflects, um, you know, magistrates not specifically kind of ticking the risk assessment box as part of their kind of referral uh, terms of reference criteria there. And in a quarter of reports, there were various other psychological tests administered, most frequently the adolescent anger rating scale and the Beck youth inventories. Okay, so uh, in all but two cases where cognitive testing was undertaken, the measure used was the Wexler abbreviated scale of intelligence, which is really a brief kind of IQ screen. 
Uh, and when we kind of uh, combine the results of either clinician administered uh, WASIs uh, with the results from any recent cognitive assessments referred to in the reports, you can see in that bottom left, um, the bottom graph there that half of the children uh, with those assessments fell within the extremely low to kind of borderline range for estimated IQ and another quarter were kind of below average. Socio-moral development was assessed using a version of the socio moral uh, reflection measure in all cases which provides a fairly broad kind of indicator cater of maturity stage for socio-moral development uh, by asking kind of the young person a standard set of, um, kind of open-ended questions. And just under half of children with those assessments were assessed by clinicians as having a, a kind of mature uh, level of, of moral development, whereas just over half were considered at an immature level or, or to kind of vary in their level of uh, moral reasoning. So overall, psychologists gave evidence to support the presumption being fully upheld or upheld for at least some of the charges in just under half of the reports. On the right side of the slide, you can see that the child's kind of understanding of the legal consequences of their behaviour behaviours or, or the lack of that understanding was you know, most common among the factors that clinicians kind of cited when forming their opinions about uh, Dolly, as was um, kind of the child's level of cognitive development and their socio-moral reasoning. Where clinicians recommended the presumption be upheld, another common reason um, was around the child's mental health related functioning, and that included, you know, diagnoses, but um, mostly it was around kind of high levels of emotional distress and, and difficulties that the young person had kind of managing that. Where clinicians suggested rebuttal, this was often supported by evidence of the child's attempts to kind of conceal, deny or, or blame the offending on others. And so we observed kind of two key areas of difference. And the first was how the impact of developmental trauma uh, on children's uh, criminal culpability should be considered. So, for instance, some clinicians kind of cited its impact on children's kind of self-regulatory capacities as evidence to um, kind of uphold the presumption, whereas others cited the child's um, kind of ability to understand the wrongfulness of their behaviour outside of times where they were emotionally heightened as evidence to support rebuttal. The second area was around um, the impact of prior justice system contact. So some clinicians kind of cited this as um, kind of giving an opportunity to learn and therefore um, kind of evidence to support rebutting the presumption. Others discriminated uh, between the nature of the prior justice system contact. So for instance, whether it was for a similar or a different kind of behaviour uh, and also the need to kind of contextualise this with other evidence about the child's capacity. Finally, um, kind of vast majority of reports, clinicians made other recommendations about supports that might benefit the child, most commonly kind of mental health, disability and education supports uh, and, and a referral to a diversion program. You can see that clinicians often also recommended kind of greater support to families and parents, uh, as well as support to develop the child's kind of network of pro-social peers, their meaningful activities and their kind of positive mentoring relationships. Um, now, while we know that kind of many of these recommendations likely reflect needs related to the child's behaviour under assessment, we did note that kind of reports rarely included recommendations for interventions directly targeting specific, the specific behaviours of concern. So interventions kind of targeting aggression, um, beliefs about um, aggression and violent behaviour, negative peer pressure, risk taking and the like. Uh, and we suspected that that might um, at least in part relate to the limited availability of such kind of specialist service options in Victoria for, for children who kind of present with these um, complex clinical needs and kind of offending behaviours. Just to close off with the study's main limitations, um, and perhaps I'll just summarise the main and most important one, is that we really don't know kind of how representative this sample is of all Dolly and Capax assessments in Victoria, uh, nor whether um, kind of the findings can be generalised to other jurisdictions. 
uh, perhaps there's something unique about the cases um, that magistrates refer to the Children's Court Clinic. Uh, and also many of these assessments are actually funded privately rather than coming through the clinic. A final thing there that kind of um, makes us wonder about generalizability is kind of the clinic has these broad kind of practice principles to guide clinicians undertaking these assessments and there are some kind of quality control measures I suppose so it's likely that the approach that we see in this study is perhaps more consistent than what we might see uh, across the state and potentially even across the country. So pulling this all together before I hand back to Susie, um, so children who receive these Dolly Incapax assessments in Victoria through the clinic clearly represent uh, a kind of vulnerable or disadvantaged group with multiple uh, intersecting needs and a kind of apparent uh, mismatch with the level of service provision they're, they're receiving. Many factors are likely to be kind of contributing to and driving this mismatch, but it does highlight, I suppose, a potential link between children's unmet need and their um, kind of offending behaviours and justice involvement. So not only would that suggest that much can be done to better meet the needs of these children kind of earlier in their lives, but it also suggests that the justice system kind of as a response is not necessarily being used as a last resort uh, in responding to these children. As we said, 60% uh, of cases, the child was kind of assessed nine or more months after the relevant act, kind of demonstrating the importance of clinicians kind of weighing up the potential impact of any learning that might have occurred in the time kind of preceding the assessment. Uh, we saw cognitive testing and socio-moral reasoning testing were kind of areas of uh, relative consistency across the reports, whereas areas for kind of, I suppose, strength and consistency included whether and how developmental trauma and prior justice contact should impact children's criminal responsibility. Uh, and we think, you know, the uncertainties uh, kind of around this ultimately reflect um, kind of the challenges of translating what is uh, a legal concept into a kind of clinical or, or psychological one. There may therefore be benefit in seeking to establish some kind of clinical guidelines or principles for undertaking these assessments. Uh, and finally, while we now have these kind of preliminary insights about how clinicians undertake and approach these assessments, uh, we really don't know to what extent kind of their opinions and justifications were accepted uh, by the court. So that is all from me. Uh, thanks for your attention and I'll just hand back over to Susie. Thanks, Nina. Go back over here. So I just want to round out the presentation by sharing some of the data that came from the professionals with whom we spoke. And really, it parallels the data that we saw in um, the presentation from Nina there, the clinical assessments. And what that tells us is that, you know, quite often, um, professionals have been saying this stuff forever and a day um, and quite often it's often said that we all oh, we need the hard data but professionals really do know what they're talking about they see it day to day in their practice um, and it parallels what the data shows which was professionals were citing very high levels of early adversity and trauma in this particular group of children um, family difficulties and a high level of child protection involvement characterized this group of children according to the professionals with whom we spoke they also spoke about the considerable educational exclusion and disconnection of this group of children, complex mental health and disability related needs, and also a limited engagement with clinical and therapeutic services um, for various reasons, some are because inaccessibility or services just actually not existing in the first place. So really what we can take from the findings as a whole is that um, what we can see is an exclusion and marginalisation of this group of children from pro-social and therapeutic settings and relationships, which must lead us to question whether, as the UN guides us to do, we are using our criminal justice system as a last resort. 
Um, I definitely, yeah, I'm not going to be able to have much time to go into vast detail about the professional's observations, but I'd encourage people to look at the larger report if you're interested in um, reading more to that effect. But what I do want to move on is to what their perspectives were on what an alternative system could look like. They certainly outlined some general principles for an alternative system were, for example, the, the minimum age of criminal responsibility to be um, raised. So professionals thought that viewing children with early harmful behaviours through a trauma-informed and child wellbeing lens was essential. They thought that any support should focus on um, family support, not just the child on their own. The child's therapeutic needs, particularly those related to mental health and disability. Um, the focus should be on connecting children to culture and community, so those pro-social kind of experiences, and connecting or back to engagement or, or further into education for these children. The professionals emphasised that there should be minimum minimum police involvement with this group of children and the role of police in the in the event of raising the minimum age should be a focus on supporting referrals um, to these kinds of services or, or a network of services that should be available to these children. Um, some participants, and this is probably one of the more controversial findings, and, and there was a, a bit of to and fro about how many people felt about this, but some did raise the idea of whether a secure therapeutic setting would be needed as an alternative to custody for some younger people um, in this cohort. Um, so overall, the, taking all their comments together, basically what they were suggesting was that an alternative two-pronged system could be most um, applicable to if the minimum age of criminal responsibility was raised um, to, for actually responding to harmful kind, kinds of behaviours in, in younger children. They suggested that most children could would only need a diversionary case management approach. They said that this kind of approach should be um, targeting low risk behaviours. It should only be, del be delivered on a voluntary basis. It should involve a lot of assertive outreach by organisations or whoever is running it, that it, it absolutely needed to be culturally appropriate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and culturally and linguistically diverse children. Key to this kind of diversionary case management approach as well is a sense that it needed to be multidisciplinary in nature, um, that it needs to be able to cover the range of challenges and needs that this group of children present with. A small, um, a small number of um, children were thought to perhaps need a, a more intensive response, and some participants suggested that this could be delivered by a court-mandated therapeutic treatment order type um, type of a situation. We have these kinds of therapeutic treatment orders in Victoria already for sexually abusive behaviours. They run separate to the criminal division of the Children's Court, um, and they run via the family division of the Children's Court, and, and they're a therapeutic option. So some participants suggested this kind of a court mandated therapeutic option might be necessary for a very small number of children who have higher risk or violent behaviours and that we could adapt the current um, TTOs, the therapeutic treatment orders that we have available, um, and that this kind of um, support would need to be delivered by a, potentially a different type of service that was more intensive in nature, assertive, uh, and had that forensic expertise to be able to deliver those kinds of supports and address those kinds of more serious needs. So the study implications overall, drawing together everything that we saw and, and all the uh, findings, was that the alleged and proven offending of this 10 to 13-year-old group of children is predominantly non-violent and predominantly time-limited, and that's particularly the case for those younger children, the 10 and 11-year-olds in this cohort. There appears to be significant scope to improve early therapeutic and social support interventions for children aged 10 to 13 years who have alleged offending or harmful behaviours. And certainly we, we came to the conclusion that the presumption of dolly incapacs where it's retained it needs to be applied, interpreted and recorded in a more consistent and rigorous manner. So that brings us to the end of the formal part of the presentation. Um, we've provided links there both to the larger report and to a sort, smaller summary report um, that are available on the Australian Institute of Criminology criminology website and we certainly encourage anyone to get in touch if you have any other queries um, that we can help with but we'll open it up to a Q&A now if people have any particular questions. You're on mute Rosemary. Rosemary if you if you want to just unmute. Yes, sorry I just realised that. Thank you everybody. Uh, I see that we've got quite a few people here present and I've been uh, 
following the chat section, but thus far there aren't any questions. So I just wondered if perhaps I could make one or two observations and then if people wanted to pop in a question, I can certainly keep an eye out for it. I think um, fundamentally what the challenge is with this particular cohort is how do you persuade the community and legal decision makers that you can balance responsibility for actions uh, with taking into account immaturity of, an, of a child's age. And that is, I think, what's, um, what's at the heart of all of this. And it's how we go about providing approaches that seem to accommodate both of these particular aspects. One of the things that you've, you've both said is you've made recommendations about uh, about other approaches, about how there can be the use of case management for diversion and how there can be some court mandated treatment programs. But they, they're predicated, aren't they, on, as you said, having a multidisciplinary approach. And yet we have a legal system that is not multidisciplinary in approach. So really, we're making some recommendations, aren't we, about problem solving approaches that uh, I suppose mirror some of the, the, the French, the Scandinavian and some of the American approaches where they have, if you like, case management courts. So I just wondered if there are things that Susie or Nina you've taken into account as part of the recommendations that you're making? Yes, well, so, I mean, certainly, yeah, the multidisciplinary nature of children's needs was obvious from, from the findings, as you say. I think a really interesting example to go to is to have a look at what the ACT, the Australian Capital Territory, who were, have already agreed to raise their minimum age to 14 years, are doing. So what they ended up doing um, as an alternative, is, and they put this in their legislation, was that they were going to recruit a multidisciplinary panel. Um, it was going to have an expert, you know, uh, from, you know, uh, Indigenous development, from disability, uh, forensic mental health, uh, family violence, child protection and so forth. So they actually legislated that, that they had to recruit this, this particular panel and that in their jurisdiction, that panel would guide the responses um, that would then be delivered by community agencies. So that's the way they're going forward. I think they are able to do that because, A, they have raised their minimum age and B, they're quite a small jurisdiction, meaning that they can, you know, shape these one-on-one -on -one responses. They're not dealing with an enormous number of children. Um, so I think the Victoria in response will need to look a bit different. As we know, by the end of this year, Victoria will raise the minimum age to 12 years, and in a couple of years' time, it'll be raised to 14 years. So we're going to have to think very carefully about um, what's going to be a suitable response in this jurisdiction. But certainly, yeah, the Northern Territory, sim in a similar situation, have raised the age to 12, but I'm not sure have actually implemented um, a very robust response. Nina, was there anything you wanted to add? We've got a very important comment here in the chat from from um, from Marion, uh, who says that in Queensland uh, they have, for example, some significant diversion options already, anger management modules, etc. And she makes, I think, the powerful point that can you pull these out so somehow they are available to children before they get into the statutory yes. system. And, and I, I think she underlines that, that, yeah. that very significant thing that many of these services and interventions are available once you're in the system. What happens prior to that? That's absolutely a, an excellent point made and it is absolutely a pertinent point because what we do see is rightfully so, uh, there are legal protections for children who are younger, but this means there is an, often a delay to them receiving so the small number that do need more intensive services receiving them. There is um, a reluctance to involve children in the justice system because it is so stigmatising. However, there is no reason why these kinds of supports can't be offered external to the justice system on a voluntary basis. And that's what um, the findings would suggest would be more helpful than, than, okay. than the punitive responses we've been going with. There's a Thank you, Susie. There's also a really um, important point made by um, Endelkachu Gage. I hope I have pronounced your name correctly. 
uh, and um, they refer to the absence of data and reference to culturally and racially diverse children and young people, particularly the African and Pacifica cohort. And I wondered if you could comment on that and on the, um, the perhaps the lack of data. Uh, certainly, the, the, in terms of the broad data from Victoria Police, the way we were able to identify um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children is because in some way at least those data are collected by Victoria Police. Right. Uh, rather, in terms of other cultural backgrounds, it's not. Um, it's not, it's, and even the data on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children is, you know, they have to use an algorithm to test whether they've actually got that right. So part of the issue is the not collecting of it. Um, certainly it was raised in some of the qualitative data, the unique needs of, of that particular group of children, the, particularly the Pacifica cohort. Um, one of the interesting things I think we note is the um, that in the Victorian context, we see African children, well, at the time of this study, actually were getting involved in the justice system at later ages. The younger children, the 10 and 11-year-olds, did not tend to be, um, from, from the observations of uh, the, the qualitative service providers, did not seem to be from, from um, culturally and racially diverse backgrounds other than Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander overrepresentation. So it was not highlighted so much for the younger age group. Thanks, Susie. There's a very good comment, thank you, to Brooke Rigney, who, who talks about the challenge in uh, holistic case management approaches is who takes the lead on case management. And I think that that's a, a key issue you've raised about the, the need for, for coherence and consistency across these approaches. And um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that part of the issue there is that we need to find a way that it is not a fragmented response because we know historically that um, child welfare, child protection, however you want to, uh, but that kind of arena has been not great at dealing with prob call it problematic or harmful behaviours that we've needed to bring in the expertise of people from disability, from forensic psychology background. So if we are not able to form these responses in a holistic way, um, it will continue to be problematic. I think secondary consultation um, and, and finding a way to work together um, rather than in these separate, inter separate disciplinary silos will be an absolute necessity if we're going to be able to move forward. Thank you. There's one last comment. I know I can see Ben uh, suggesting we need to to um, fix. We need to finish, but I think there's a good point made by Joanna Price Murray from the ACT that uh, there are children actually as young as eight for whom services really need to be considered, and I think that's a really important point that there's lots of pre pre obvious factors, if you like, for children who are going to ultimately come into the offending system and what are we doing to, to be alert and aware to those. It's so where you. there are small numbers of, of those children. So it's it's being able to provide and make the case to government for a service provision response where the numbers might be quite small, but the impact of not intervening early can be quite significant. Yes. There's a good point, and the one last comment, Ben, made by Nathan Gallagher, who, who comments on uh, approaches to conceptualising what is offending behaviour and, uh, and making assumptions about the, the lens with which children coming into the contact of the system might be viewed within. And I, I think that that gets to the heart of trying to, to make sense of, uh, of some consistency, some coherence across approaches. But unfortunately, the, the way our governments are, are structured and our departmental, departmental services are structured, there's such significant fragmentation, it's hard to achieve. Uh, but thank you very much to everybody who's put some really good comments here in the meeting chat, and I hope I've done them brief justice. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Rosemary, and thanks, uh, Nina and Susan. Um, that was a fantastic presentation, such important work, um, such uh, interesting research. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, and I'm hoping to see you next month uh, where we have, uh, uh, sorry, Jesse Kale, uh, Dr. Jesse Kale from Griffith presenting on uh, young people who sexually offend. So um, look out on the mailing list. 
I'll be sending through a, a satisfaction survey um, shortly, so I'd really appreciate it if uh, you could fill that out. And um, otherwise, thank you, and I'll see you next time.